So well, welcome, welcome, welcome to uh, to uh, the Position Enterprise Grand Rounds. Today we're going to give you an update and um, focus on improving chronic kid kidney disease diagnosis and management. Um, and underneath this story of the management of chronic kidney disease is, I think, a Herculean effort by many of the people that you see on the screen today on the correction of how we calculate EGFR, um, removing you know, race from that equation. Uh, and it's really a great moment for us as we look at our teamwork between you know, all, all the groups uh, coming together in the physician enterprise, laboratory, um, the diversity equity team, um, just so many people you know, getting together and figuring out and correcting this problem. And I think we're just about to the finish line in terms of the actual practical nature of how we do that. So hats off to everybody. So let me introduce our, our speakers today. We have a lot of people, so I'm gonna give very brief introductions as I stated before we got on here, I just want, I'll tell you everyone's amazing. So I can then say that and then just give you a brief introduction. And our first speaker today is gonna to be Dr. Victor Waters, who is the chief medical officer for Dignity Health St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center and Dignity Health St. Joseph's Westgate Medical Center. Uh, he is a distinguished physician with more than 35 years of clinical experience in emergency medicine and internal medicine and 20 years of administrative leadership. We have Dr. Khalid Bashir, who is an associate professor at the Department of Medicine at Creighton University School of Medicine. He's board certified internal medicine, nephrology, and critical care. That's a lot of board certifications um, with a real strong interest in ICU nephrology. We have um, Gay Woods here, who is the system vice president for equity and inclusion in the Office of Diversity. Her role focuses on the development of health equity strategies to reduce disparities and improve health outcomes and advance population health. We have Dr. Nathan Ziegler, uh, the System Vice President for Diversity, Leadership, and Performance Excellence for Common Spirit, where he supports a health equity blueprint for action and leads strategic initiatives aimed at achieving equitable health care for all people. As always, we have Dr. Anka Sagar, who is our Vice President for Clinical Standards. And of course, we have our fearless leader, Dr. Gary Greenswag, who is the Chief Physician Executive for the Physician Enterprise. Did I forget anybody? That's okay. Good. We are offering ABIM MOC credit today's talk. That's great news, even for me, as I need these things. Um, please enter any questions and comments into the chat. And let's get started. I think we're off first with Victor. Victor Waters. So, Victor, take it away. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. And it's a real honor to speak uh, about this uh, very key topic uh, in healthcare right now, particularly as it deals with health equity. Um, I was invited to, we had launched back in February 27th a health equity event. Uh, called Equity Heals, and you'll learn more about that. And I'm just going to give a high level, but uh, it's Health Equity Heals, a kidney health outreach. And basically, we worked with the Diversity Inclusion Council, as well as our leadership in Phoenix, Arizona, and, and leadership and community leaders. We all got together, and I was one of the speakers there. And what I'm doing is I'm going to give you a condensed version of what I shared uh, Gary Grinswick, who was uh, part of that uh, speaker circuit, you know, invited me to this. So I'm really honored to do this. So let's get into this. This is a very high level, but for physicians, I think it'll still, I'll have some significant take home points for you. So starting the next slide. So I want to start with the patients because patients are first. This is a patient, uh, let's call his name Jimmy. And uh, he was diagnosed at the age of 40 with uh, chronic renal failure. And he had risk factors, hypertension, diabetes. Uh, he went on to uh, progress in requiring hemodialysis, and he was on <laughs> hemodialysis for about 15 years. Um, he began to circle out of control clinically, uh, sepsis infections, and removing shunts, and really a significant amount of pain and suffering, uh, particularly during the latter portion of his care. Uh, and then he eventually died of, of sepsis uh, complications. I mention it because um, Jim is a cousin 
of mine is a relative, a very close relative I've known my entire life. Go on the next slide. And so, you know, we're all touched one way or the other by kidney disease. We may know a relative, we know, may know family that's impacted. It certainly impacted me seeing uh, close relatives spiral downhill and the impact that has. The data is pretty clear and, we, and there's gonna be more about this, but uh, fundamentally there's, uh, black Americans are about four times more likely to develop kidney failure. Um, it's just very well known for multiple reasons why that happens. And that's another two hour lecture if we're gonna go into those reasons. Next slide. But as you know, one in three are at risk. And I mentioned risk is hypertension, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, et cetera. And more than 37 million adults may actually have chronic kidney disease. It's different than chronic renal failure, but chronic kidney disease. Kidney failure, over a half million have kidney failure and may require some form of dialysis. So, and, and 106,000 are, are waiting for transplants in this country. Those are basic figures, but it gives you the magnitude of how healthcare, uh, chronic renal failure, the silent killer, literally the silent killer, uh, until you get on those hemodialysis machines, um, really impact patient care. Next slide. Well, we have here in, uh, in St. Joe's Medical Center has a transplant program I'm really proud of, and you can see the exponential growth of our kidney transplant uh, program in numbers. It just shows that uh, not only the program is, is really busy, it's busy because of the volume and demands, and we have an amazing turnaround in terms of getting people on transplant lists and getting them uh, getting them the kidney. So it's it's really a tribute to our team locally. I have to do a shout out for our local team here. Next slide. Well, here's some basics. You know, we, we talk about chronic kid, kidney disease and chronic renal failure, and often that's a part of it that is determined by the EGFR. And this is the core, this is the core issue of why we launched our, our community outreach. Uh, those of you who are physicians know what the uh, glomerular uh, the diagram is all about. I'm not going to go into that, but basically it's about the calculator, GFR calculator. You know what those components are, creatinine, age, sex. And the other component, which is really the key one here that's been discussed is race. There's a historical reason for why race was included, particularly for African-Americans. There were some assumptions based on prior studies and uh, that may be related to body mass, that there may be differences between uh, Caucasians in the African American community because of body mass, diet, and clearance. Well, more recently, that was determined not to be correct, and the, and it really has had some impact because if you think about it, the corrective factor actually gave patients and physicians who were basing those calculations a false sense of security that maybe those borderline cases are actually okay and they're normal. And so African-American patients were given this false sense of security that they're not as severe. And there's a downhill consequence for that. For example, they uh, may not be referred uh, earlier to a kidney specialist. They may not be in a transplant list uh, until a little bit later. And they may end up more with uh, severe kind of complications from chronic renal failure as a result of the delay. So it's very important to understand that the race factor uh, that was included in EGFR is no longer an accepted standard. And our reference labs in Common Spirit, almost, almost 93, 94% of them have been corrected for that, which is a great thing. But now we need to connect the dots and, and share with the community the need for screening and explain the history as well as our accountability to uh, correct this, uh, this issue and create a health equity mission. Next slide. So there's ranges, as, as many of you know, and as I mentioned, when you have these borderline cases, say uh, 60 GFR, and the estimated for African Americans is 25% higher uh, than expected, then he may be falling into that normal range, which where he could easily be in, in, in a mild uh, kidney state, kidney disease state. So it's extremely important that these indicators are accurate and so that it we can follow through the proper action plans. Next slide. So here's a case example. Uh, this shows uh, a EGFR of an African-American that uh, if you include 
just the Caucasian number, you'll see the Caucasian number is 46. And if you calculate it based on race, you see it's 10 points higher, 56, 56. So it's quite a, quite a difference and quite a difference in terms of care management. And that's my point. But the real take home point is, it may, may be surprise many of you, but I have no problem sharing it. This is quite old. But uh, the main point is, these are my lab tests. These are my lab tests. Now, because I'm a physician, I'm certainly aware of the challenges with the EGFR. And of course, my advocating for my own care was able to speak up and get the proper care and get follow through. And certainly it's, it's really been a great experience. But the fact is there are many, many more uh, patients out there that are not getting the, uh, the care they need and the proactive stance and stabilizing their hypertension or diabetes, understanding the ramifications. So I share this personal story because this is what impassions me to really get to the community and share. I don't want people to, to miss opportunities uh, that my cousin may have had the opportunity to have earlier uh, affordable treatment. So, so I think that's the end of my slides and uh, I'd be welcome to questions and answers at the end of this, but that's all I have to share, Tom. Thank you for, uh, you know, allowing me to share this story. And Gary, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you again. Uh, Dr. Basir. Thank you all. And uh, thank you, Dr. Waters, for the presentation. And that helps me actually, I can be more focused on um, some of the areas uh, I, I guess you've covered a lot of areas which were in my talk, but I'll try to kind of just uh, give a, an update uh, of why CKD, why we're talking about today, and what's new. Uh, and a lot has happened in the last five years, and EGFR is, is, uh, is one of them, and, and we're very proud of uh, this part that we have gotten moving. More work needs to be done. However, when it comes to science, uh, there's also new development. And uh, next slide, please. Um, maybe a minute or two in terms of just reminding everybody, uh, who do we look for when we think about CKD? Uh, it's hypertension people, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. And you need to have, for diagnosis, you need to have two abnormal tests uh, in either category, either low GFR or albuminuria. Uh, more than three months apart. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a great slide and actually it encompasses, uh, it's from KDGO, and it encompasses not only uh, the staging on chronic kidney disease, but also how we should refer. Um, so on the, on the, um, you can see G1, G2, G3, this is all the GFR and, and, and the numbers, and A1, A2, A3 refers to the uh, albumin excretion. Uh, and then in the green, yellow, orange, and red, you can see the severity, and it actually just portends the prognosis going forward. Uh, and the green or light blue L-shaped uh, bar uh, is for the referrals. So you can see that albuminuria, if it's high enough, can actually cause um, a patient to progress quickly and therefore imparts its lot of severity. Next slide, please. So um, with that background, how we diagnose YCKD and, and how do we state and how do we refer, I wanna just uh, pivot to uh, two new classes of drugs. Uh, which have become centerpiece in terms of management of CKD. And it all happened in the last uh, seven years. There were close to 20 trials. And two classes are SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, and, and then the other one is uh, non-steroidal mineralocorticoid antagonists. So SGLT2 inhibitors are the one which actually a lot of you are aware, um, uh, people know about Jardians, people know about Farsiga, and, and they have acquired a centerpiece in terms of our management. Uh, just a quick uh, review, uh, when we have CKD, especially we have 
diabetes. Uh, it causes a fundamental change in the hemodynamic uh, issues of glomerulus. Says you have an activation of RAS system. You have high A2, angiotensin in two, which causes efferent vasoconstriction. You also have a decreased flow as a result of overexpression of SGLT2 inhibitors, which causes afferent vasodilatation. So the end result is glomerular hypertension. And we all know that ACE inhibitors can cause uh, efferent vasodilatation, and that's been the reason why they have been very successful in improving outcomes. However, now we have a drug which can actually cause efferent uh, changes as well, and that is SGLT2 inhibitor. So these drugs can actually restore the hemodynamics of the glomerulus, and that's been the proposed mechanism why it helps down the road. Next slide, please. With that, um, I will talk about just the three main trials, <coughs> uh, Credence trial, DAPA-CKD, and EMPA kidney. And you can see um, on, this, uh, on this slide that EMPA kidney, uh, which are the blue, um, blue lines, it encompasses across the board. Um, it has the largest um, uh, uh, number of patients and the stages, both in terms of the GFRs and the albuminuria. Next slide, please. So the first trial which came out in 2019 was published called Credence Trial. Uh, it is about Campagloflozin. Um, they looked at diabetics. They looked at diabetics and they looked at um, a GFR, uh, which was between 30 and 90 and an albumin, albumin to creatinine ratio of more than 300 and less than 500 milligrams per gram. Uh, and the primary composite outcome was end-stage kidney disease, doubling of serum creatinine, and death by kidney causes. Next slide, please. So I won't bore you with a lot of the science and details, but the take-home message is you can see the first four graphs, A, B, C, D. It's about kidney disease. All four show improved outcomes, relative risk reduction of about 30% of the primary composite outcome, relative risk reduction of about 34% in the renal-specific outcomes, and 32% relative risk reduction in end-stage kidney disease. And the number needed to treat was 22. Next slide, please. So this also shows the urinary albumin to creatinine ratio improved about 30% from the mean, uh, which is huge, which is also one of the proposed mechanisms why it helps in patients with proteinuria and CKD. Next slide, please. So the next trial, out of those three, this is a second trial. Uh, this trial, uh, dapagloflozin, included not only diabetics, but non-diabetics as well. You can see um, that EGFR was from 25 to 75. Uh, urinary albumin creatinine ratio was more than 200 milligram to less than uh, 5,000 milligram per gram. 10 milligram of uh, dapagloflozin, and the primary composite outcome was uh, sustained uh, uh, more than 50% EGFR from the baseline and end state kidney disease or renal cardiovascular death. Follow was 2.4 years. Next slide, please. So this shows, uh, as you can see, this is the primary composite outcome. So uh, relative risk reduction of 39% on 10 milligram of dapagloflozin. Uh, 312 events in placebo, 197 events uh, in the study drug in the study group. Next slide, please. So I put this slide in just to see that that this is a a, a uh, for me um, this is a great news because this not only helped the type two diabetics, which is the graph on the left side, but patients without type two diabetes. You can see the relative risk reduction of 50 percent. So. Uh, they found that dapagloflozin helps not only the diabetics with proteinuria, but also patients uh, who have proteinuria without diabetes. Next slide, please. So this is the last trial um, I'll talk about from SGLT2 inhibitor. This is the AMPA kidney trial. Now, this trial actually included um, a vast majority of patients across the board when it comes to chronic kidney disease. You can see on the right-hand side, um, uh, there is 31% diabetic nephropathy, there's glomerular disease, there's ischemic hypertensive patients, there are 12% others. 
And it was done across eight countries, Europe, North America, and Asia, fairly representative of a lot of patients from different ethnic backgrounds, uh, a large inclusion criteria of eGFR from 20 to less than 45. And if you have a high GFR, more than 45, less than 90, you have proteinuria. And primary composite outcome was cardiovascular renal death or maintenance of dialysis and kidney transplant. Next slide, please. So with that, I'm gonna just um, show you just a take home message you can see. Uh, you can see the curves there. So uh, about 432 patients uh, in the study group uh, and about 558 patients in the placebo group had the outcome. And uh, there was about 28% relative risk reduction in the study group. And the number needed to treat was 28. Next slide, please. So we talked about SGLT2. So this is one class um, of drugs which have now achieved um, a, a centerpiece status in terms of management. The other class uh, of drugs which just came out uh, was a phenorenone. This is a non steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. We're all aware of spironolactone. Uh, we know that we have used it in a lot of patients with congestive heart failure. Uh, it's, it's, it's recommended, and, and some patients with proteinuria and difficult to control hypertension, but this, uh, this drug uh, is more specific for the receptor, uh, and we all know the mineralocortical receptors are, are activated in a pathologic state, especially diabetes. They're found in heart, they're found in kidney, they're found in blood vessels, and their overactivation leads to fibrosis and inflammation. So with that in mind, this drug was tested, <clears throat> And we, are, we were actually part of this trial. Um, I was the PI on this trial. Um, and um, we had about 13,000 patients. Next slide, please. So uh, I won't bore you again with a lot of uh, science here, but you can see the curves. So this is, um, there were two trials, there's Figaro and Fidelio. So Fidelio had the renal outcome as primary outcome, uh, close to 5,000 plus patients. Uh, you can see that uh, the at 36 months, um, there was 18% uh, relative risk reduction. Now, remember, this trial had diabetics as well as the ones which had uh, proteinuria, but there was a clear um, um, difference and uh, uh, improvement in outcomes on the study drug. Next slide, please. So, we talked about SGLT2 inhibitors. We talked about phenorenone, which is a non steroidal mineralocorticoid inhibitor. Well, where do we stand in 2023? I think this slide in front of us from KDGO for 2022 is a great one because it gives you kind of an algorithm uh, and how to think through this. Uh, you can see that um, the first line drug therapy SGLT2 is now right next to metformin. So that is in, it, in diabetics and type two, di type 2 diabetics and chronic kidney disease. So you can see the statin, uh, uh, ROS inhibitor, uh, ACE or ARBs, metformin, and now SGLT2 inhibitor right next to it. And after that, uh, further therapy can be based on additional risk factors. So if you have uh, persistent proteinuria, you can use mineralocorticoid uh, uh, antagonists like phenorinone. Uh, if you have issues with glycemic control, you can use a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And if you have difficulty with hypertension, um, then you can use dihydropyridine or a diuretic as needed to go forward. Now, this is a great um, slide for the patients with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease. Now, what was striking for me was out of these trials, especially with SGLT2, is that I see a lot of patients who have chronic kidney disease with proteinuria or with minimal proteinuria, but they're not diabetics. So ACE inhibitors were the only option for them. However, uh, looking at the um, uh, DEPA, um, looking at the DEPA and the EMPA trials, in chronic kidney disease, now we have options. So SGLT2 inhibitors can be used in patients, not only in diabetics, but patients with chronic kidney disease across the wide variety of pathology. Uh, so this is um, uh, something which is new. Uh, these trials were published in the last two or three years, 
and I do believe going forward will become uh, part of our everyday management for chronic kidney disease. I think that's all I have. All right, um, that's terrific. Um, uh, we're getting a few questions in the Q&A and feel free to put them in the Q&A and chat. And let's move to Dr. Nathan Ziegler and Gay Woods. Thank you, Dr. Greenswig. It's great to be with all of you today. I'm going to share my screen here so we can walk through some of our slides. Hey, do you see our presentation okay? Yeah. Great, thank you. So I'm uh, Nathan Ziegler, Assistant VP of Diversity, Leadership and Performance Excellence. What I'd like to share with you is how we brought this work together, the research that's been done, the examination of the EGFR as it's pertained to uh, disparities within the African-American population and how we've transformed this as a health equity strategy to ad advance the clinical outcomes of African-American patients with chronic kidney disease. Um, this all comes together around Common Spirit Health, Health Equity Blueprint for Action. This Blueprint for Action was designed by partners from across the ministry, from physician enterprise, population health, community health, uh, IT, medical informatics, quality, and so on. It was really a collaborative effort to identify five core areas around health equity that we needed to focus our efforts on through health equity partnerships, collaborations with one another. You'll see the five pillars stated here, Transform Within, which really focuses on getting our house in order, ensuring we have health equity within our workforce, within our uh, clinical population, and ensuring that we have the necessary tools, resources, uh, to advance health equity within those populations. We've also focused on building our analytic engine. Last year, we had a goal focused on the collection of race, ethnicity, and language patient information that really gave us a foundation to understand, to better understand the health disparities that exist uh, across different population groups. Where this project lands is around our standardized equitable, equitable whole person care. We've really wanted to lean in to, with our clini clinical experts to understand ways that we can address health equity by creating equitable clinical protocols and measures that help advance the work from a clinical perspective. In addition to that, we have a pillar around community impact and um, social justice and, and advocating for equity through policy change. These are all collaborative efforts that we are partnering with uh, leaders that leaders are driving from across the ministry. That being said, our health equity blueprint has been anchored around an LTIP goal for the organization around improving equitable outcomes. The board last year approved the real LTIP goal, which was around collecting race, ethnicity, and language information. This year, the goal has been really around advancing health outcomes from a health equity lens. So when we partnered with um, Dr. McGinn, Dr. Greenswig, and Dr. Cigar, Gay and I and the five of us sat down and really designed, um, and Rosalind Carpenter, pardon me, our, our chief diversity officer, designed a project that would take the, the research that's been done around the EGFR and really bring it down into the communities and the patients that we serve. Our goal has been to, um, change the EGFR calculation, which Dr. Sagar has led. We are at 96% transitioning our labs across the ministry. It's a tremendous accomplishment, far surpassing our goal of 82%. Uh, we've also had, uh, which you've just heard a little bit from Dr. Bashir, uh, a focus on developing a clinical outcomes pilot that helps us better understand using clinical uh, data, uh, the transition between stage two and three four and five and how the, the EGFR has impacted those outcomes. Our team, and led by Gay Woods, has focused on how do we bring this down to the community, to the patients? How do we communicate these cha changes leveraging a restorative justice lens? So as you know, there have been disparities uh, 
related to race and ethnicity and healthcare for ages, for decades. It's, it's a, a chronic problem for the United States. And the EGFR just is another example of a disparity that is impacting African-Americans disproportionately. So by applying a, a restorative justice lens, what we want to do is really focus on how do we own the problem? How do we rebuild trust? And how do we advance the work through uh, partnerships by getting close to the communities that we serve, by getting proximate to our communities to strengthen that engagement, to strengthen those partnerships, and to really have uh, a sharing of, of power and capacity building with our communities. We also wanted to integrate uh, community-minded, you know, community-focused uh, leaders to help us connect the dots, to help us bring the new EGFR test to communities, to uh, raise awareness around chronic kidney disease and the need to get a new EGFR test to better understand where a person is with chronic kidney disease. And finally, to remove the barriers and dispel the different stereotypes associated um, to healthcare and to the clinical outcomes of African Americans and other uh, underserved populations to advance health justice. So this community pilot, I'm gonna turn it over to Gay, has really been designed to rebuild trust and to get close to the communities that we serve, to share in the work with them, to bring awareness and education as tools to leverage this new EGFR test. So I'm excited to introduce Gay Woods, our system vice president of equity and inclusion, who's really led this work with the community. Gay? Thank you, Nathan. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Um, equity Heals addressing chronic kidney diseases. Uh, we wanted to really put Equity Heals forward um, as a engagement point of this work as we lean into our relationship with community. Proximity is something that we talk about often and, and it's, it's very critical as we think about trust building um, and as we think about you know, really speaking to the historical impacts of racism on, on healthcare. And so one of the things that we were thinking about in the design of, of this work um, was really about if what if we could change language? What if we could change the understanding of what EGFR uh, means in, for the patient um, and put it forward in the common everyday language lexicon that um, we see A1C, how that's progressed, we see an understanding of high blood pressure, um, cholesterol, that's moved over the years um, in such a way that it's on commercials and uh, everyone has some level, some basic understanding. And so we've been thinking about that as it relates to chronic kidney disease and how could we start a movement to that end that um, the patient and community understands EGFR. What is this, what is it about and, and how it relates specifically to them? Next slide. So in designing the, the pilot itself, we wanted to think about a brief um, education and awareness intervention that could be focused on in community and focused on uh, patients, thinking specifically about some of the drivers that we know are increasing um, poor outcomes um, in CKD. So the lab changes was definitely a part of that, but also thinking about just the low knowledge that um, both patients and community broadly have about um, the disease itself and the progression of it. So when you see those numbers on your lab, really understanding what that means for you, um, what you can do to really slow or stave off uh, further progression of the disease. So that's really what our awareness and education uh, components are centered on. Next slide. So we wanted to do this work across three levers. One is, of course, in that increasing awareness. And we're partnering with the National Kidney Foundation um, to utilize some tools that they have to speak to that. One of those is, are you the 33%? Uh, it is definitely a, um, a first level health literacy approach to um, opening the conversation around chronic kidney disease. We also wanted to think about screening. How can we increase access and activation 
for community to get screened. And we will be working with community-based organizations to stand up some screenings um, in community. So away from the clinical setting uh, in places where people um, work, live and play. And then the last is to think about sustainability. How can we embed these pieces in community, whether it's through community health workers or navigators um, or certified lay workers um, who could be uh, important within faith, faith environments and other settings to be able to navigate, help support community around the disease itself. Next slide. So one of the things you've heard uh, through Dr. Waters and, uh, and Nathan that we launched in February, um, we chose Arizona as a learning site for this work. Um, it was great because they already have a lot of um, prioritization around health equity and um, from a board and hospital standpoint. And there was a great foundation of community organizations that we could leverage in terms of beginning to kind of fast start this work um, with community. So you see a number of those organizations represented on this slide. We had a great cross section um, from organizations that have a high disease understanding of uh, kidney disease and the intersection of it related to comorbidities. Uh, Faith-based communities were definitely represented. Um, and then within our own um, team across Common Spirit and, and St. Joseph Hospital. So it's a great, great attendance, um, great kickoff and great conversation, which some of the uh, comments from the next slide um, were key takeaways from, from that meeting. And as you can imagine, the, the things that came forward first were really around trust, like how are um, organizations, healthcare, uh, responding and meeting the issue of trust building with community and that we must be prepared to stand in the uncomfortableness of the historical impacts of racism on, on, on health change, particularly pointed for populations such as the African-American. Um, we know that co-creation is very important, that we couldn't just design a an approach to this work, but it must be informed from a community's perspective and, and deciding you know, who are those trusted community organizations that would be important for us as part of this work. And the last one um, was really to be mindful about how we balance our mission, our commitment to mission um, and financial investment in, in this work. Those are key takeaways from, from our conversations from that meeting. So as we move to the next slide, we knew that having an uncommon steps uh, in meeting community was going to be important. So this is one of the ad designs that we used at one of our first large community touch points, which was the Arizona Jazz Festival, kind of something that you would think, OK, how does this fit gay? <laughs> but um, it did because of the population that we wanted to touch. Uh, the demographics for the attendees of this event was exactly um, the who that we wanted to, to meet and come close to. And so we wanted to use the National Kidney Association's One Minute for Your Health, which is a, it's a gateway assessment essentially around chronic kidney disease that um, asks questions around uh, family history, around um, diabetes, you know, any comorbidities. Um, race is a, a, as a question, as a component of it as well. And it gives the uh, individual a, a soft level uh, assessment score um, around their risk level and encourages them further if they are at a higher risk to seek um, care or additional screening from their provider, or they can also request a home kit um, and so we were able to use this as a point of engagement um, during that festival to connect with, with individuals. And it was a powerful way to begin the conversation. Um, and so we will be using this tool across our reach as we really um, have a population um, strategy to begin the conversation, just to raise it uh, for people um, as we're talking about a number of other disease states and taking it to to places where where people are um, doing other things, but we're going to speak to them about about their health. Next slide. 
So this slide um, is a, the results, a glimpse of some of the results. We have a lot of data actually from that initial uh, event at the festival. We were able to touch over 500 people during that festival. Um, the majority, 82% of that uh, reach was African-American. Uh, Hispanic was the next largest um, segment. Um, in terms of age, it was especially um, in our target range, which is 51 to 64, um, but also starting earlier, you see a great representation of that 36 to 50. 73% of the total uh, reach were um, female. And what is startling around all of that information is that 61% showed a high um, risk factor for kidney disease. And that was affirming uh, for what we think we know, um, but it also is very um, much um, encouraging and it drives us forward to figure out how we reach community even further in the education around the, the EGFR change and also what people can do. How do you um, move to address that? And that's what we're thinking about further as next steps um, within this pilot. Next slide. So these are some of the things that over the next uh, months that we are really focused on uh, in terms of just partnerships and in that proximity strategy of really bringing information to the broadest uh, audiences that we can um, and to be able to stand up some screening events uh, between now and June. So a lot of um, great representation that you'll see here that is still staying in the sweet spot of community-based organizations of uh, women and men specifically focused um, events, as well as our faith community. And we know that this work is, is just beginning um, and we are getting a lot of response from community in terms of interest uh, to participate with us. And so we're, we're working on you know, how we pace ourselves across it over the next year um, as we focus on the Arizona market. But the goal is to really um, develop a playbook that we could use to disseminate across our system in terms of how do we bring this information from the outreach to community uh, process. Uh, we know that um, this has been a tremendous lift for many teams. And this in front of you is just a short list of all the people that have worked on this. Um, from our laboratory information services to our medical informatics teams, nephrology, ODEIB, our medical staff societies, and of course the clinical standards and the PE team. And you know the names listed here, and I'll come back to them, are sort of what we consider our absolute partners in this work, and they share credit for everything that I'm going to talk about to follow. So a little bit about clinical standards and what is our aspirational goal? And I say it's an aspirational goal because Common Spirit is very early in this process, is to really improve the way clinical care and decision-making occurs. And it's not because physicians and APPs and our clinical teams don't know what to do. They know what to do, but there is an immense cognitive load that they have to go through every time they see a patient. So we want to make decision-making a little easier. We want to make sure that it is evidence-based. It is rooted in process improvement methodologies, whether it's from the IHI or whether it's from a lot of other improvement organizations. And we really want to follow the premise of implementation science, right? We want to measure our clinical impact. We want to measure our balance and make sure there are no adverse events. But this work doesn't happen in silos. And what I'm going to talk about just for a few minutes is how this process comes to be and the importance of this and how we can consider using this process in other ways. So our why is because our team is firmly grounded in the fact that we know adherence to evidence-based medicine decreases variation and it improves high value cost conscious care for our patients and our communities. And what that translates into is more birthdays and anniversaries and independence, right? More walks in the park, uh, maybe more time spent outside swimming with loved ones. But it also improves patient experience and a sense of confidence that when 
me as a patient, I walk into Common Spirit Health facilities or practices, I'm getting the best care that's out there. Most importantly, what we've learned in this process over the last year plus is that this process has improved engagement because it gives our physicians and APPs a chance to share their clinical voice. It improves recognition of their expertise and it feeds that internal drive, if I was to quote anybody, is the internal drive and motivation, right? And all of that then pays forward by improving the way that we do work every day. The way that we identify how we're going to do work, what's the topic we're going to pick, is really um, in these three buckets. So one is that there is an existing standard that we need to meet. So in this case, it was the um, National Kidney Foundation, ASN, coming forward with their guidelines saying we need to transition this over. Or it's de novo creation. And sometimes you all may be getting emails from us uh, saying, hey, we heard you're doing some fantastic work. Can you give us a few minutes and we want to learn more? Our third one is what we call emerging needs. And that means that there is a brand new way of doing things. There is guidelines that have changed or there is an emerging public health need, COVID being an example, that we need to pivot to. All of our topics are high visibility, high variation, high volume, and high value. And the value needs to be on both the patient side, but also our clinical team side, because we wanna make sure that when we go in and we say process has changed, or need a new guideline, it actually means something significant for both sides of the equation. I won't go into the details of our exact process. I'm happy to take questions, um, but there is a space for everybody to be part of this process is what I want to come across. Whether it's from thinking about a topic and if you have an idea, send it to us. To, hey, I wanna get involved. I wanna be on a clinical work group. Again, reach out to us. Or if you have feedback on guidelines and information and insights that are coming out from the team, we do a continuous improvement process, meaning we take feedback and all of these guidelines are living documents that we update. And I just wanna say a little bit about how did we start on this journey of EGFR? So the National Kidney Foundation, ASN, recommended the transition and it came to our forefront because there was a request placed from both the ODEIB, as well as some of our frontline clinicians saying, we really have to do this work. And sort of that's when clinical standards started to embark on this journey to bring together these teams to say, what is needed to make this a reality? We went through our process. And what I will say is this clinical work group is probably one of the most amazing things and processes to watch happening. So if you ever want to come and see magic occur, uh, we welcome you to join one of our meetings because people are very engaged and they are so passionate. It really fills your cup. So dissemination, uh, we have multiple ways that we disseminate information and we continue to add to this. But most importantly, I wanna point out this idea of clinical guidelines within the EMR and integration of these guidelines in the EMR. Um, I want to be very appreciative of our medical informatics teams because they have come forth and embraced this passion with us to say, how can we make it easier for people to not have to leave the EMR to do the right thing or to find out what needs to be done? And I'll give you a very small example. Um, one of the ideas was, well, why can't we just put in a message in the lab report itself when an EGFR is run? And we said, great, what would it look like? And this is a schematic of, and it might change depending on where you are, a schematic of saying, well, this lab report has now changed as of this date because we transitioned. And two, if you are seeing that the EGFR is between 45 to 59, we really do recommend if you're in an ambulatory setting to get a cystatin C done one time, which is the potential uh, confirmatory test for when CKD could be diagnosed more. Um, I will not pretend to be a nephrologist. Uh, that's Dr. Bashir's job. But I will say that this has been very helpful to us. So more to come on the ways that we're going to integrate guidelines in the EMR. Uh, but the credit goes to the medical informatics teams for really embracing this idea. 
So the status of the transition, I know we've mentioned a couple of different numbers. Uh, so we are now at 96% of the facilities across Common Spirit that have transitioned. Now that is out of 120 something facilities. So congratulations, tremendous work. Um, and vast majority of our partners, meaning LabQuest, LabCore, uh, as well as ARUP labs have also transitioned. So no matter where you, you are sending your patients, you should be still seeing the newly transitioned EGFR. Um, aspects of this work are in front of you. We transitioned the labs. There's a communication cascade. And what this means is we are continuing to communicate, distribute this information. There's an implementation pilot um, that we are currently working towards. And of course, you just heard from the ODEIB team how they are leading in the patient and community outreach portion of this. I come back to the slide because there is always room on the team for folks who want to be involved in this work, right? Um, this is not a silo. This is not a firm team, meaning that there's always room around the table. So if you're interested, please reach out. And paths forward uh, for the communication cascade, as I said, EMR and embedding guidelines is something we're very interested in exploring. Implementation pilot, uh, we are thinking about how do we capture that clinical impact and what do we do next? Um, talk about patient community outreach. But lastly, it doesn't necessarily stop here. Now that we've transitioned, we're able to accurately diagnose patients with CKD, we want to focus to make sure patients are reassessed, right? Communities are encouraged to come back in for an assessment or maybe their first time assessment. And then also think about improvement efforts for curbing the progression of kidney disease. All the great things that Dr. Bashir talked about are new innovations. That's sort of the paradigm we want to move towards. And I will stop there to, to give us time for some Q&A. All right. So we have a few minutes uh, if folks have questions or comments. Um, there was one comment in the chat about registries and data analysis, and certainly work has been done in that area. And I'm gonna, you probably know the most about that <laughs> as well. But um, And actually, we're collaborating with Dr. Bashir uh, uh, at uh, Creighton as well. But do you, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I saw that question come through, so thank you uh, for giving us a minute. I'll be brief and say that that is an excellent point, and we continue to sort of comb the ways in which we can automate that process. Um, and I think automation is key because um, we want to use our staff and our manual time very carefully in the places in which we would get the most rep, um return on that staff time, right? So that means, hey, can we identify everybody who should be getting an EGFR checked because they had XYZ um, underlying diagnoses and they haven't come in to be checked for a year, right? Um, and then those who come in, let's now say, hey, we should really start thinking about chronic kidney disease progression and how do we curb that for you since you are in stage three or stage two. And these are all the ways that we wanna um, make sure that you have the right tools and the right meds. So much more to come on that, um, but this work is really being led uh, by our, our nephrology teams, as well as our um, enterprise BI teams, and um, of course, uh, much more implementation work ahead. Yeah, I think it is, this is an unusual, in a way, performance improvement project, because it's not that there was an issue with people acting on the numbers. The issue was they had the wrong numbers. It was the recipe was wrong. And, and we think that most people who see an EGFR, you know, getting to 30 or below know what to do. It's that the patients who should have been getting to 30 and below were not because of the formula. And so it, it's, an, it's an interesting, there, there certainly has been some re-education about chronic kidney disease in general. And new developments, as Dr. Bashir talked about, but it's that sort of benchmark of you've you've passed 30. It's kind of like in Monopoly, collect $200, pass 30, whatever. But but it, you, we have to know, you know, those are the patients that we really need to be sure that they get into care. And frankly, those are the very patients who were delayed. Um, I, I have one other 
sort of thing, um, and Nathan and Gay and, and others and Victor, um, when we were in Phoenix um, having the kickoff with the community, uh, we talked a bit about structural racism and like, why did this happen in the first place? And why has it taken us uh, 12 or 20 years to figure it out? And what do you clinicians have to say about that? And it, it was a very interesting moment in the meeting where we we basically said, look, this, um, you know, this was best judgment at the time, but it was wrong and we're, we're here to fix it. And, and I think people took that at face value and uh, didn't sort of beat us up too much, like, you know, once again, but, but I, I, I do think that, that that will come up and that it's important that we're open and honest and that we apologize. It wasn't us who changed the formula, but it's us who have fixed it. So I don't know, Victor, if you have any thoughts about that or Gay or Oh, you're you're right, and Gary. Um, it needed that's the elephant in the room that needed to be discussed. The, to your exact point, because there was a feeling of another something else that is against us, and then we didn't even know. Here we are again, uh, feeling victimized by a system, uh, and we're already hurting in so many ways. Um, and I think you know your response was absolutely amazing. Um, but what we did was bridge the gap, um, explaining that nothing had been done in malice, uh, in malfeasance, and in intent to harm anyone. Is this to your point? The standard of care uh, changes, <laughs> and, and that's what we do with, in terms of standard of care. We all, I grew up with the the EGFR estimate and accepted it as that's what we do. This is a known entity and there was no pushback from uh national medical association ama or any other organizations because we accepted that and and that was the lens we were looking at this is what we call standard of care uh and you, you can never quarterback right quarterback backwards and say ah you know you should have known better you know this is what medicine's all about yeah i would just add that that is the justice piece that we speak about, which is truth, then action. That our ability to stand in the truth of that. And Dr. Greenswick, your response in that moment, it it's a it's it it is it brings you know the community closer to us just because you're willing to say, you know, we were wrong and we're doing something about it. And I think we've seen that as we, you know, continue to have conversations with community. That is that is our justice work. So thank you for bringing that up. And I would just add that uh, something as clinicians to take back if patients, as patients start to learn about that, is to sit with it and to, and to honor it, their feelings about it, and to say, we're sorry. You know, I think that. Uh, what Gay just said about Dr. Greenswig's response was so powerful because it's acknowledging and validating the experience of a of a person of color, an African American person in this case, and saying we're sorry. This is a form of structural racism. It, not all racism has malice actions behind it or ugly behaviors. Some of it is part of the design of a structure that is creating these inequities and us acknowledging that and changing it is that restorative justice piece. I, I think there's lots of opportunities for us to do that. So um, we're just after eight and uh, I just wanna thank our entire panel, um, uh, Dr. Bashir, Nathan, Victor, Gay, uh, John for helping us, uh, Dr. Sagar for leading this effort and putting all of this together and to all of the folks who joined us. Um, uh, there's more coming about this. Um, and I'm assuming, Gay, that we're, we're going to do more than Arizona, right? <laughs> but but we're, we're, we've got our training <laughs> wheels on in Arizona. So we'll be out to visit uh, somewhere near you, hopefully. But thank you uh, for not just for the morning, but for what this morning represents in terms of a whole year of work. Uh, and a, sort of an incredible journey that we've been on. So uh, thanks to all the people who joined us and we'll send out a link and uh, we'll hear more.